nice fish. Nice fish. Get a nice little tuck cast in that pocket. And hit the olive flash. Paragon. Nice. Nice solid brownie here. Ah, here we go. Nice brownie. Thank you there, Mr. Brown. So I'm uh, back on Pence Creek in Central PA. And what I'd like to do today is I want to talk about the five, what I feel are the five most important things you can learn to really become a better urinympher, to really up your urinympha game. And I'll, I'll start out with casting. Um, you can see that fish right here. You got a small pocket just behind that rock. And I did a tuck cast right in kind of that white water and he hit probably 12 inches into the drift. Uh, and the reason I was able to get that fish right away is because I was tight to the cider. So if I were to learn anything, or if I, I'm sorry, if I were to teach anybody one thing and one thing only to become better, it would actually be casting. And I've, I've done a casting video and I hope you check that out. Uh, but I really feel like the, and I don't know why, but the cast is so downplayed when it comes to uranymphing. But when you look at all the best uranymphers out there, they have one thing in common and that's their ability to cast. Tucking the flies in, flies hitting the water first, tight to the cider right away. You can cast and fish at distance. The river opens up for you when you really become a good caster. There's a nice fish. <clears throat> nice fish. Get the olive flash again. Nice chunk of the brownie. Boy, look at that red tail. So I'm gonna tell you what I did here in a second to get that fish. Good looking brownie. Boy, look at that tail. What a gorgeous, gorgeous chunk brownie. Look at that red tail. Colors on that thing, absolutely stunning. Thank you there, Mr. Brown. So this is a really cool spot here. So I caught that first brownie right here he was tucked in right there and i did a tuck cast and you can see this rock right here so it was just behind that rock so i tucked it in and he hit it right away so i love i really love areas like this you see this rock there's a bit of a trough in front of it got some pretty good current so obviously i made an upstream cast and i made that cast and i stopped my rod high the flies went over they tucked in and I got to depth right away, and he hit probably maybe halfway into the drift. If I would have done a lazy lob, I would have never gotten my flies down to depth. Uh, you know, I was able to get that fish because I made that really nice tuck cast, dove the flies down, and I really attribute that fish to my ability to cast. So, so once again, I can't stress the importance of casting. If you were to just learn one thing from this video, just learn how to cast because that is the thing right out of the gates that's going to up your nymphing game. Casting, learn how to drive those bugs into the strike zone right away. There we go. I don't know, boy, it's a nice fish. I, um, I don't know if you saw what I did there, is I made a, it's, we have some depth down here. So I made a nice tuck cast. I got my flies to depth right away. And as the, as the run got a little deeper there at the bottom end, I just lowered my cider into the water and he nailed it. He hit the dropper, got a France fly. Nice, nice chunk. 
Thank you there, Mr. Brown. Nice 14 incher. Nice fish. So this run right here, it's a little shallow here. Right there, it drops off and gets deeper there. So I fired my bugs over, did a nice tuck cast. My bugs got the depth right away. And because of that, when it got to the far end here, right about there, I was able to lower my rod and dip my cider into the water and that fish hit. Had I not tucked it in, if I would have kind of lazily flipped it over there, it would have taken all the way to the end to maybe get to depth. And that's the importance of that tuck cast, getting it over to the rod tip, driving those bugs into the water. And I'm gonna show you how to do that here in a moment. So <clears throat> the way I like to do a tuck cast is, it's just human nature. Um, people look at a run and where their intended target is, they tend to go like this and they end up pointing the rod tip where they're looking. And that's why the bugs ends up, they kind of slap on the water and the cider hits the water. So what you should do, instead of focusing on the run and your target, look above the target, look in the horizon. In this case, you see that kind of bent tree. And what's gonna happen is, so we're gonna look at our run and we have the correct amount of line out. So just before we release our front cast or our forward cast, look up into the horizon there. And in this case, that bent tree, and you're gonna end up stopping your rod tip there. So boom, rod st stops at that tree. You see the flies dove over the tip of the rod. So just stop the rod right at that bent tree, boom. The flies fly over the tip of the rod and they just tuck right in, just like that. That's the tuck cast right there. If you wanna do a full tuck cast, what I like to do is I'll even look up higher. So we're not gonna look at that bent tree, we're gonna look at those, say those, the second, I don't know if you could see it out there, there's a couple pine tree limbs, and we're gonna stop it up there. But what you have to do is, when you make the forward cast and you stop it, just give a little. So you're gonna stop and then give a little. So it's you stop high, then give a little. And what that does is the bugs fly over the rod tip, and when they start, they kind of reach the apex, and then they start diving down. And the reason you wanna give a little is you wanna create a little bit of slack that enables your flies to drive to the bottom. You don't wanna have any tension in the line because they'll end up pulling back. So once again, we're gonna look at that second limb up there and we're gonna do a nice tuck cast. Stop, boom, and I gave. So just stop. And you can see how they just, so stop, boom. So stop high give a little and the flies just dive right down. Completely unhindered by any tension in the line. So it's stop high, give a little, the flies just go right over and they dive straight down to the bottom. That's it, that's the tuck cast, real easy. Just stop high, give a little, boom, flies tuck over the rod, drive straight down to the bottom. So here's a situation. We got some depth here, but you have this overhanging limb right here. And if we do a full on tuck, we're gonna get stuck. So you can actually do a tuck with a water load cast. And, and honestly, the water load cast is really easy. You're putting the flies behind you. You're, the tension's created by the current, and then you're just driving the flies forward, right? So the casting motion is abbreviated because You've loaded the rod with the water, you're moving your arm forward, you can see the wrist is cocked back, and I just simply move it forward. But if you keep the rod low and you go to high, the flies will still shoot up and go down, and it'll be a tuck cast, it's just a little bit different. So once again, boom, it's in the zone, it tucked right in there. <laughs> that was a hit. Boom, tucks right in and we're into our drift there. So it's just one of those casting techniques that as you become a better caster, 
you just add it to your bag of tricks. Tuck it in, nice drift right through there. So we got a nice pocket here. We got some limbs behind us. So when you're casting, you always got to look at your surroundings. Look above you, look straight up, and look behind you. And so you just, there's nothing more frustrating than getting hung up in trees, especially if they're behind you because you're not paying attention. So I can't really do a normal cast, meaning an overhead cast. So I've got to do it sideways. So once again, it's casting. Sometimes it's just situational. But you can see, you can go sideways and really tuck it in there and do a really effective job. But it's, everything is practice. I mean, time on the water allows you to do this. There's a fish right there. Thank you there, Mr. Brown. Beautiful fish today. Absolutely beautiful fish today. So my uh, battery died on me. I did a quick change there, but so these limbs right above me here, I couldn't do a, I, I had to do a tuck cast because that's a really quick pocket right there. Just a beautiful, just a, I love areas like this. You got, you got a pocket, it's slower, but yet there's current and trout love these things, especially when you've got, this is very shallow in here too, but it's shallow where I'm standing, but that's about two feet deep and it's quick. So you got to get those flies down really quick. So that sidearm tuck cast, I went low to high, low to high, and I was able to drive my bugs down there, got it to depth right away, and he hit probably four feet into the drift. So once again, this casting sometimes is just situational. When you got limbs, just be aware of it and you can still do a nice tuck cast. There's a nice fish there too. Nice fish. Boy, I'm catching some solid brownies today. Love Penn's Creek. The average size fish here is just fabulous. This is just really beautiful fish. Got him on my I'll crystal flash uh, paragon or my I'll peri flash paragon I should say look at that beautiful red on it thank you there Mr. Brown I I think uh, the water load cast is a great way to uh, to really make the perfect cast and it forces you to slow down a bit because you can't rush it because you're having the water behind you you know, load the flies and it's giving you a little resistance so you can't really rip it through the water. And you can see, all you gotta do is we're gonna throw our flies behind us. We're gonna have it, so this little run right here, you got a little pocket right there. Um, it looks really good. <laughs> there should be a fish there. Uh, but we wanna have, we wanna make sure our flies are 180 degrees behind us. And then we're gonna slide it and we're just gonna simply release the cast forward so it's like the casting stroke where we're stopping here we're having our rent wrist bent backwards and then we're releasing forward and you can see my hand is still parallel with my forearm and we're just letting the rod do the work and we're just flipping it forward it's such an easy cast to do not a lot of effort and you can make really nice accurate cast <laughs> slide it forward let the rod tip do the work you can be highly accurate. We want to ultimately have our rod tip point where we want our flies. So you can't just move it forward and stop. If you want your flies to land up there, you can't stop your rod tip here because the flies are going to follow your rod tip. So boom, goes right where I want it. It's just following the rod tip. Boom, right in there. There we go. Nice fish. Nice fish. So I'm going to tell you what I did here. Nice jump. After I land this fish, look at this brownie. 
These things are so sweet. <clears throat> Quick release. So what I did there is made the drift. I followed my cider. Then when I went into the back cast, I turned my head and I looked and I knew exactly where I wanted to have my bugs. So when I made my drift, I went into the back cast, I turned my head, I looked, and then I fired it up and I put it exactly where I wanted and that's where that fish was. So every cast you have, every time your rod goes into the back cast, you're doing one or two things. You're doing a false cast to put your flies in the 180 degree mark behind you of your target, or you're going forward and you're putting the bugs where you want it to go. So just keep that in mind. Every time you make that cast, have a destination, have a target in mind, and put it where you're looking. He hit twice, hit on the cast before that. So obviously I've talked about casting for a long time here. I just think it is, ap without a doubt, the most important thing you can learn. He hit the uh, France fly. It is the number one thing to learn to really up your game. But what do we do after we make that cast? What's the next step? Thank you there, Mr. Brown. So what's the next step? So the second thing you need to learn is managing your line. So we make the cast, now the current creates slack in our line and we have to keep up with our bugs. So we gotta do it a couple different ways. So I'm just going by memory here. I think on the cast before that, I managed it like that, and then the second cast, I actually put it in my trigger finger. So, the mistake that I see people make is they make this cast, and they one-arm it. Actually, I see that a lot. They one-arm it, flies hit, and they start moving their rod. They do this, they move their rod. Now, that certainly works, but what I find is the people that uh, fish like that they, they struggle in water like this because they start moving the rod and they start pulling their flies downstream. And they, they tend to do better in say medium runs where you know they catch up to the flies and then they start moving their rod. So people will go out and they'll catch fish like that. So that's what they do all the time, right? But there is a better way to do it. Have these two hands working in tandem Bugs hit, and I start working in the slack with my non-rod hand. That's one way I do it. And when I actually caught the fish, is I tucked it in there, I moved it to my trigger finger, and I just started stripping it in. So I moved it to the trigger finger while it was, actually my middle finger, I moved it while it was in the air. Just make a, new, a nice transition, and I just did one big long strip, just like that. There's another way you can do it. You can figure eight it. I typically do that in slower runs, uh, but you can make a cast, move it to your trigger finger, and then you can figure eight it in. But you wanna stick the, rod, stick the landing and manage the slack to the rod, not with the rod. And when I get up in a slower run, I'll really show you what I mean by that. But in quick water, I usually just pull the line back away from the rod, but you'd wanna, you want the hands working in tandem, bugs stick, and then you're working the slack back. Really get away from using just one hand, your rod hand. This hand is just as important as this hand. All right, this looks like a really good spot. Let's make a really nice cast. And we're going to manage that line and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pull it away with my non-rod hand. There's a fish. You can see just uh, get away from that rock. Nice fish too. 
you can see that I, um, you know, I stuck the cast and just immediately used my non-rod hand, started bringing in that slack. I was tight to my cider right away and ended up, ended up hooking this really, really nice brownie into the net. He hit my olive flash. Boy, that's a nice 15 inch fish right there. Just solid fish. Thank you there, Mr. Brown. You can see as I cast, I'm just ready to manage my line the moment the bugs hit the water. There's no, there's no hesitation. Everything is in unison. Hands are all working together. Bugs hit the water, I start managing it. The moment it hits the water, I'm ready. And you can see I'm taking it to the rod. The rod sticks. I'm managing it right away. You can see as the flies are in the air, I'm actually moving it over to my middle finger and I have time to do that. You can see I'm figure eighting here because it's a little slower. But whatever is most comfortable to you is all that matters. This is a good looking run on the other side. so. Got a lot of stuff happening here. We got fast current. You got this gravel bar that just drops down. You got an overhanging limb. So <laughs> the first cast, I'm gonna drop it up in here, but I really want it more here because that's that shelf. So I gotta tuck it down there and keep it away from these limbs here. But I got limbs behind me. So actually what I gotta do is I gotta do a water load cast, low to high, Boom, it's in there. And I can elevate my cider right there. And there's a fish right there. So that was all, I made that all happen with a water load cast, low to high, tucked it in on that shelf, managed the slack to my rod, moved the rod a little when I got vertical and the fish hit. Boy, these are fighters. Ah, that's okay. That was an easy release. So once again, I went low to high. The bugs went over the rod tip and just tucked in right on that ledge. And I was able to get to depth right away because it drops off pretty severe there. I mean, it goes from a foot to probably three feet right there. So I was able to get vertical and that's a five foot space. And honestly, if you're a lobber, if you flip it over there, you would have never gotten the depth right there. Well, it would have been really hard because of that limb anyway. So use that low to high, manage it to the rod tip, and then move the rod with the current just to keep up with your cider. And then you can get vertical when you have the proper depth. <clears throat> okay, so, so we've talked about the importance of casting. We talked about the importance of line management. And the third thing you got to get really good at to really up your game is you need to manage your weight. It's weight management. And what I mean by that is <clears throat> how much weight is necessary to get your bugs down into the strike zone. And there's a, so this particular run I caught that fish a moment ago, actually almost caught it. Uh, it's deep out here, but there's a bit of a ledge in front of me and I caught it right on this side. Uh, so it was right on that ledge. And um, I'm using, a, my bottom fly is a 2.8 millimeter bead. It's a size 16 olive flash paradigm and I have a 2.3 bead on my dropper. <clears throat> but I'm trying to get out more in the middle of that run and I'm having a hard time to achieving the depth that I want. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go from a 2.8 bead to a 3.3 bead, same size bug, size 16, same bug. And what it's gonna do, it's gonna help me get to depth quicker. 
right out in the heart of that run. So let's see how we do here. And you can see I'm using a Davy knot. I don't know if you can see it on camera. And I really think a problem that uh, people have, it's the reluctance to change flies is because they're not very good knot tires. And you can see how quickly I just put that fly on with a Davy knot. And so, you know, if you're a lot of people I see fishing and and all of a sudden, you know, they should be managing their weight. Should be, they should be changing their flies, but they don't do it because it takes them a long time to change. And my suggestion to you is pick a knot and get really good at it. I mean, you can sit there and watch TV and and practice your knot tying over and over and over. So now I got a 3-3 three, three bead on and I really think that's gonna be the ticket to get to where I want to. So let's do a water load cast, load a high, get it in there. Yeah, and I can already tell I'm really getting a great drift in there. Load a high, boom. There's a fish right there. <clears throat> oh, I'm gonna have to. So I ch change bead size. I might have to chase them a little bit. It's in this current. So I went up a bead size and I got deep in the heart of that run. And I just simply would not have been able to do that if I had that 2.8 bead on. So managing your weight is so key. And, and you can see in this case, I end up pulling out this nice little brownie. Thank you there, Mr. Brown. Yeah, I love to tie flies. Uh, and I will tie them in an array of different weights. Um, I'll tie them, I tie flies 2.0 beads, 2.3, 2.5, 2.8, 3.0, 3.3, 3.5, I mean, you don't have to be as fanatical as me, but I really like to dial it in. But if you, you can stick with, you know, kind of the, if you do the 2.5s, and 3.0s and 3.5s and maybe a four, or you can do a 2.3, 2.8, 3.3, and a 3.8. If you tie your flies in those sizes, um, you are literally, you can use all kinds of different weights and uh, you know, you can distribute, you know, you, if you need, if you've got a 3.3 on the bottom and you need a little bit more weight, you can move your dropper to a 2.8. It gives you a little bit more weight. So it's things like that that you need to do. You tinker around to try to find that right formula to get you to depth. Um, I like having my heaviest weight on the bottom and I like the lighter weight on top because I'm in two distinctly different columns uh, for fishing, especially this time of year. It's the beginning of June. There's all kinds of bug activity. There's a lot of fish. Um, that are looking up so you get a ton of fish on the droppers I don't like fishing to the same weights unless I mean never say never um, if the fish are hard on the bottom usually winter time I might do that um, and to be honest with you if that happens in the winter time I'm usually just using one single fly and I don't have anything on the dropper and that's another thing you don't always have to fish two flies uh, yesterday evening I was fishing really shallow water it was, you know, one and a half to two feet deep. Every now and then you might get a three foot pocket, which was rare. It was more like one and a half to two feet. I had one single fly on, and depending on the, the current, I was switching between a single 2.5 and a single 2.8, and that's all I needed. So just remember, you don't always have to have two flies on. Now I've moved up a little in this run. I was fishing right here, and I moved up a little. And I'm keeping my 3.3 bead on the bottom, even though I know as far as the depth here, I can achieve that depth with a 2.8. The reason I have the heavier bug on, I'm keeping it on, is the wind is kicked up. So that's another thing that I see people struggle with. It's if they're fishing an area and it's calm and they've got a 2.8 on the bottom, uh, then all of a sudden they show up and they're having success and then they show up to the same spot the next day and suddenly you got a 10 to 15 mile an hour wind 
you're not achieving the depth that you achieved the day before. The wind is severely affecting your drift. So you need to change your weight. You need to manage that weight based on the conditions. And the biggest thing I see is very windy conditions. Even in two feet of water, sometimes I might have a 3.3 or a 3.5 bead on if it's extremely windy. So the wind is kicked up. Let's see if we can get a fish out of this run here now with the heavier bead. I saw a fish rise. So I'm not doing a tuck cast here. It's not necessary because it's shallow, but I'm getting a nice drift in there. There's a fish. So once again, it was managing weight. I kept the heavier bead on, even though it's relatively shallow in there. And I know if it was calm, I'd have a 2.8 bead on, but I had to have the 3.3 on just to fight the wind. Nice little guy. Thank you there, Mr. Brown. Still have that 3-3 bead on, and this is the next cast, and this is a decent fish here. <laughs> Very next cast. I believe he, no, yeah, he's on the uh, olive flash. I love it when these bigger fish go upstream and nice current. Get him in this pocket here. That's just a nice chunk. Pence Creek brownie. Nice 14 inch fish. Just a really good looking fish. Thank you there, Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Brown. I really hate the advice that some people give that you know you need to feel your bugs bouncing on the bottom. That's simply not true. You are trying to keep your bugs just above the bottom in that slower current, and you need to have the right weight to do that. Every now and then you will bounce on bottom, and that's okay, but every now and then if you feel it ticking bottom, fine. But you don't want to have it tick, 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 tick. If it's doing that, one, your bugs are drifting too slow, it's not natural, and you will get hung up. So when that happens, go one weight size lighter, and then you're probably gonna be in the perfect zone. Nice fish right there. So what I did here is, that run I was just fishing is right there, I moved up here, the wind died down a bit, it's shallow. I switched my bug back to a 2.8, had the right drift in there, then he hit it. This guy hit the dropper. No, I'm sorry, no, he did hit the bottom fly. Thank you there, oh, thank you there, Mr. Brown. So it goes back to, once again, being really efficient in knots, tying knots. Learn a really good knot, whether it's a Davy, whether it's a clinch. Learn it, learn how to tie that thing in your sleep. And when you do that, you're just gonna change weights when you need to at the appropriate time. And it's just gonna make your fishing more enjoyable, quite frankly, if you get really good at knot tying. So in a, 20 yard stretch here. I caught, I think I caught four out of that run. I got one with a 2.8 bead. I got three with a 3.3. Three. I moved up 20 yards, switched back to a 2.8, and I believe that was my second cast, and I got that decent brownie. So I don't know if you could see that on camera. Bringing it right down this edge closest to me and my sighter barely twitched. Just barely moved. 
she hit the dropper. Got a France fly on, size 18. Thank you, Mr. Brown. I haven't even gotten out to the heart of that riffle yet, but right on the edge in front of me, I did a nice tuck cast, got it to depth, and I was watching a nice little bow on my cider. It barely twitched, and I had that fish. And that's the, the next thing, the fourth thing that you really, really got to get good at to up your game, and that's the ability to read the cider. The cider, it really is the eyes to the bottom. It's your eyes to tell you what's going on underneath with your bugs. It's, it tells you whether you're not at the right depth, it tells you whether you're getting kicked out of the drift, whether you need more weight, whether you need to lighten up. And you really gotta get good at reading the ciders. So this is a nice run here. I have a 3-3 bead on, it's a Paragon. It's gonna enable me to really drive the flies down pretty quick. <clears throat> There's some nice depth in here. It's probably about three feet. My cider is going slightly slower than the surface current, which tells me that we're accessing the strike zone. <clears throat> There's a fish. <clears throat> So I had a vertical cider right in front of me there, and my cider barely moved. It just twitched upstream. And that's the key, really. When you're really starting to elevate your game, you're gonna move from feeling fish strike to seeing them strike. Because if you're feeling most of your strikes, that means you're missing a lot of fish. So it's really, really critical that you watch that cider, it's a nice little chunk, watch that cider for all the visual cues. So how do you know if you're at depth? So once again, this run is about three feet. It's got some current. I do, um, if, there, if it was calmer, I would probably have a 2.8 bead on, but I have a 3.3 three because I'm managing my weight and there's a lot of wind, so I know I can get it down a lot easier that way. So. How did I know I was at depth? Well, if that cider is moving slightly slower than the surface current, you know you're in the zone. So in this case, I did a tuck cast up there. It drove the flies down, and then I was probably two feet in the drift, and I could tell my cider just kind of shifted. It got a little slower. Devin Olson, call, Devin Olson calls it the downshift. I just simply say it's going slower than the surface current. So. That's what you want to do. You just want it going slower than the surface current. And when you achieve that, like right there, and this is the kind of run you can get vertical on your cider. And what I mean by that is when we get vertical right there, we know that drift is bottoming out. So <clears throat> you got to play around with your tippet, tippet length. I like a short amount of tippet because I use a micro leader so I can dunk my cider, but I have about four feet of tippet from my tippet ring to my point fly. And uh, you know, it's really perfect here for three feet. Right here, slowing down. And I'm dipping my cider just a tad to achieve death. I'm dipping it just a tad to achieve. Now right there it kicked out. So what happened was my cider, I was really at depth right here, but it it's a little deeper here and what happened was it, my cider kind of tilted backwards and when that happens that means you're getting kicked out of the drift so there's a little shallow spot there i was at depth when it got below that right here my cider kind of went that way when you're seeing your cider move out of your drift that means it's getting caught in the heavier current above that slower current and it's knocking it out of the drift so once again the cider tells you everything so in order to fish that properly, I need to either step back or put a little bit more weight on. So in this case, I'm just gonna take a couple steps back here and I can throw up higher and I can probably achieve depth there. So right there, see now I'm just in the drift where I got kicked out a minute ago right there. 
it's one of those things where it's time on the water. Time on the water is going to help you learn to read your cider. A mistake I see people make is they have too much tippet and then they end up putting their cider on the water and what happens is your cider is going to get way ahead of your bugs. Your bugs are going to lag behind if they're at depth and what happens is you'll miss a lot of strikes or you'll ultimately end up feeling it and missing the fish because the fish has to work out that slack between the cider and, uh, and your fly and that's when you ultimately feel the fish but a lot of times it's a little bit too late so you really have got to dial in the tippet length um, uh, you know you want it around one and a half times the depth of the water and so don't be afraid once again it goes back to tying knots don't be afraid to lengthen or shorten your tippet but yeah. I like my cider right on the surface because the closer you get that cider to the water level um, it really it, it gives you a lot of visual feedback, much more than if it was a foot or so above. So let's take a couple steps up. <clears throat> Get a tuck cast. I got a vertical cider right away. It's going slower than the surface current. And I know I have the right amount of weight because every drift seems to be really, really good in here. Right there, it's achieving depth. And I'm just watching for any visual cue. It's twitch, stop, anything that just looks different than the speed of the current. <clears throat> and you strike at everything. Because a lot of times, it's amazing how I've caught some really large fish where the cider just simply just, it barely moved. And then you set the hook and then you're into a big fish. So you just gotta watch for all the cues that the cider gives. If your cider is going down the stream and it's all loose, that means you've got too much tippet. The fly is lagging behind. Um, if it gets kicked out downstream, that means it's you're too light and you're not down far enough. If it get kicks left or kicks right, it's the same thing. It's just it's hitting these other kind of microcurrents underneath there. And typically, when you see your cider get kicked left, right, or, or backwards, that means you don't have enough weight on. <clears throat> so it's usually sometimes only one bead size that gets you down the depth. But just learn to read that cider. It really tells you everything. So I can get vertical right here. There's a fish. So. <clears throat> what I did is I took two steps up, made the same cast, and it, I got the depth, and I just saw the cider just twitch upstream, and I got a pretty nice fish on right here, real nice fish. Get him out of that current, move him over here. Real. Real nice brownie. Boy, what a beauty. Fish. What a beauty. Absolute beauty. What a nice chunk. Good 16 incher right there. Hit my uh, size 18 France. Look at that beautiful, beautiful brownie. Nice 16 incher. Thank you, that Mr. Brown. Good stuff. I always talk about getting a vertical cider. Your cider is usually vertical from, you know, maybe a 45 degree angle in front of you to a 45 degree angle below you. If you can get up to a run like this and it's deep enough to do that, you can almost fish under the rod tip and you can start getting vertical here and then you you know you're at depth if you're at vertical. When I was downstream a bit, I was throwing up and my flies were f floating over that fish and achieving depth below it. So I took two steps up, threw up, I got vertical and I could tell because it slowed down and it just twitched right in front of me and I caught that beautiful 16 inch brownie.
So once again, when you move from feel and you go to seeing your strikes, you really got the keys to the kingdom. It really, that's when you know you've really taken your game to another level. So just pay attention to that cider. It gives you every cue that you need to know of what your bugs are doing underneath. A lot of wind, I'm staying ahead of my cider, but I can see that it's still going slower than the surface current. Right there, it picks up speed. So what happened was I had depth here because it's shallower. It gets deeper just below me. So I was right here, I was good, but right here my cider went this way and that means it got kicked out of the drift. That means when it got, it got a little deeper here, so right here it's shallow, it drops there. So what happens, what happened was it went like this, my cider kicked this way. That means my bugs hit the faster current above that cushion and gets, it got kicked out of the drift. So what I need to do is right here I see that shelf. So what I'll do is when I get right here, I'm gonna lower my cider a smidge into the water so I can achieve depth. So that last one I got kicked out. So once again, it's telling me what I have to do. So right here, and now I'm just gonna lower it. And I just have a really nice drift there. I really had a long drift there. So learn to listen to your cider. Your cider's telling you what you need to do. And in that last case, my cider told me I need to dunk it just a smidge, like right there, I need to bring it down and then I had a nice drift all the way through there. You need to have that rod tip. A, a bad habit people have is they'll cast and they think they need to keep the rod way ahead of their cider. You just keep your rod tip just slightly in front of your cider. Now everything is situational. If you're in shallow water, if you're fishing straight up above you, um, that's different because you're bringing it back to you. But, but here, when you can get vertical in a deeper run, you're just gonna have your rod tip just slightly ahead of your cider once you work that slack back to the rod tip. There's a fish. <clears throat> so I'll tell you what I did there. It's shallow here, it's, it's like a trough. It's deep here and it shallows off there. So what I did is, get this fish in here, hit the France fly. So what I did there is, it's a nice, nice, look at how fat that guy is. Thank you there, Mr. Brown. What I did there is, I made a cast, I'll show you here. So I made this cast upstream in the shallow water and I got vertical right here, so I'm at depth. And right here, I lifted up a little bit. And when I lifted up, it got to the right depth and that fish was sitting on the edge. Had I left my cider on the water here and I didn't lift up at the end, what would have happened is my bugs would, I either would have gotten stuck or would have just started dragging on the bottom and it would, would have looked just unnatural to the fish and he wouldn't have hit. So once again, that is what I did is two things. I, I used my cider to my advantage because I knew I was at depth, but also visually I could see it was more shallow, so I raised it up slightly to keep it in the drift. And I was rewarded. There's a, <laughs> there's a hit, just a twitch. He hit, ha. Ah missed him or I lost him I should say so right there I I got a really nice long drift and just at the end there it was almost too far but I still had enough good drift left and I just saw the bow in my cider just twitch and that's really the key so when you're looking at your cider I always tell people you, tight is let me pull my cider here and I hope you can see it that's tight that's loose that is right there. It's kind of the in-between between super tight and super loose. It's right there. You just want this really nice bow. So when you always hear me say, get tight to the cider, that's what I'm really saying is you, you get the cast in and as quick as possible, you're going to get tight to the cider. You want that nice bow in it because 
that's going to give you the cue. If you're too loose, you're, it, it's just, you're not going to, it, it's too big of a move for the fish to make. Cause trout, most, most of the time, they're very, they just open their mouth as the bug comes by in the drift, they just open the mouth and grab. So if it's too loose, the fish needs to really hold on to that bug before that slack works out and it moves it. So when you're right there, you just see these subtle, subtle moves in the cider. If it's too tight, that means you're pulling it through the drift. So it's that in-between, the in-between tight and loose. That's where you want it to be. <clears throat> really good drift there. That's a nice drift. There's a fish. <clears throat> so once again, that was heavy current here, super heavy current. We got some depth. I got a 3-3 bead on. I tucked it into that pocket. I got vertical right away, saw my cider twitched. And I got a beautiful, beautiful brownie right here. This is a good 15, 16 inch fish. Boy, look at that red tail. What a fish. Hit my France fly. What a God, what a gorgeous, gorgeous fish. Look at the red on that. God, it's almost pink. Boy, that's a 17 inches right there. Size 18 France fly. Thank you, Mr. Brown. What a beauty. Beautiful, beautiful brown. Thank you, Mr. Brown. What a fish. So I want to tell you how I got that fish here. So the last thing I really want to talk about is positioning. And now I say casting is the most important thing you can learn, but positioning before you cast is really important because you can be the best caster in the world, but if you just kind of roll up to a hole on top of it, you can cast great until your heart's content and you're not gonna catch anything because all the fish are gonna scatter. So this hole right here is, <clears throat> well, first of all, I was making about a 25 foot cast there. And if I was a lobber, it would have been really hard to do everything I needed to do on that drift to catch that fish. So my ability to cast over in that pocket about 25 feet and tuck it in there was helpful, but I'm below the fish. so. And that was a big brownie. That was a nice 17 inch fish. And I can tell you, you need to move into position to get the best cast possible and the best drift possible without blowing up the hole and spooking the fish. So, and you need to do it in a stealthy manner. You've got to be really stealthy. You got to move like a blue heron, just slow steps. You gotta take your time and move into position before you make that cast. You can't be splashing through the water, just roll up on the hole and just try to get a vertical sighter in front of you because it's just, just not gonna work. So right here, I'm below the hole here. I made an upstream cast. I got fairly vertical out in front of me. If I was over here on the side like this right here, I may or I may not have caught that fish because a large fish like that, they're just too spooky. He might not, he might move out or he actually might move up a little bit because he's gonna see me. So you have to learn the fish below. So it's all about positioning. So once again, in this case, especially this water ahead of me, I'm gonna be making upstream casts. If I get over here on the bank and try to get vertical, I'm just gonna be on top of the fish. So you gotta, you gotta position yourself and you got to move in a manner where you're not going to be sloshing around, kicking rocks and making this big disturbance. You got to kind of move into position, figure out where you want to cast and then make your cast. It's really, really critical because once again, you can do all these things right. You can cast, you can manage your line, you can have the right weight. But if you don't move in a position to make it all happen, you're just going to be really doing a lot of casting and not a lot of catching. So once again, I'm moving up here. I should make a couple casts there, but that's a good looking hole. So I'm gonna fish this edge, but I'm staying below the fish. 
and I'm gonna cast upstream and work it back to me. And I'm elevating my rod because the cider's coming back to me. I'm gonna keep moving up, fishing in front of me. Tuck it in there. Nice vertical cider in front of me. Just working it right back. Now there are sometimes you can walk up to a hole, but you have to use everything to your advantage. You've got to use obstructions like rocks or logs. You can use the current. Now if this log wasn't here, there's a beautiful side bank over there. Ah, boy, I bet you there's a fish over there. But this is a perfect example where I can roll up here. This disturbance allows me to get as close as possible. So you've got to use things like that to your advantage. I really feel like there's a fish tucked up here. And you can see this perfect example. I can't get over here to the right. I'll be on top of it. So I got to stay below. There we go. <clears throat> Did everything right. I tucked it in there. I take, you know, I'm working the stream two steps at a time. Tucked it in there. I really felt like there was going to be a fish there and stayed below it and got him to hit. He hit the France fly. Thank you there, Mr. Brown. Boy, he's a fatty. So I'm gonna walk upstream here. I'm gonna show you what not to do. And I guarantee you that fish would not have hit because I would have spooked it. <clears throat> so I'm gonna show you where this fish was. You can see that pocket. I made that cast, I'm probably, that's a good, good 30 feet away. And once again, it's all about casting. I was able to cast, stay below the fish. Most people, if you're a lobber, you can't lob at 30 feet. And if you can, you can't get tight to it right away. I was tight to that fish right away. Most people would kind of come up like this. They'd be standing right here and they would go like this, right? That fish, I cast it there, it hit right around there. Trust me. If you move up to a hole like this and you're doing this, you, I mean, yes, you can catch a fish or two. It can happen, but more than likely, those fish are gonna move out. And in this case, they're probably gonna slide up into there and they're just gonna have lockjaw. It's all about positioning and you've gotta move, once again, slowly. And if you're out on the stream and you're fishing with buddies, now you can shout in water like this because it's, it's loud, right, because of the the uh, riffles here in the rapids, but you can see I'm fishing with a buddy of mine. Shout out to uh, JB. This is a really slow area. Once we get together, we talk, but we almost talk at a whisper. You don't want to be standing in a slower area and shouting to your buddies because trust me, those fish are going to hear it. They're going to move out, especially a big fish. They're going to start moving out and they're just going to get spooked. So really you want to keep noise to a minimum and when you're walking like right here you know you just got to look down and you got to watch your step right you just got to slowly watch your step and when you're in the stream you're just going to kind of you know you want to walk and move one slow step at a time see now this is an area where i can slide up here because i'm using the water to my advantage so you can see this is a really heavy riffle in here so there's a lot of surface disturbance. So that allows me to move up onto the hole a little bit closer. Plus I have the sun, it's in, in my face. So my shadow is not cast over the hole. And that's something you really gotta pay attention to is your shadow on the water. There's a fish right there. So now he was a little ahead of me. God, I love it when they go upstream. So he was a little ahead of me there, but I was able to move within 20 feet of it. And if it was slower, I wouldn't have been able to do that. But I just slid in here, you know, my shadow's behind me. It's not cast out over the run. Got tangled up a little bit. And uh, I used the surface 
disturbance to my advantage. It's a nice chunk right there. Took the uh, olive flash paradigm. Thank you there, Mr. Brown. I think there's some more fish in here. That's one thing you really gotta pay attention to, like I was saying, is the sun. So sometimes you can't help it, right? Just depending on the side of the river you are on. So if the sun is at your back, your shadow is going over the hole. So you just gotta be aware because they will see that shadow moving in. So just make sure you're not casting your shadow over the area you're trying to fish. And in this case, it's great because the sun is in my face and the shadow, my shadow is going backwards. So I'm gonna take one step up. Get into position, look at my target, put the fly where I want it. There you go, this is a, this is a really nice fish. This is a hell of a nice fish. <clears throat> Boy, I had a, uh, had a nice bow in the cider and it was drifting through that heavy current and it just stopped. Just a 14 inch bullet. It wasn't messing around. I mean, I, I thought I had a 20 inch on, but instead I just had a chunk. <laughs> that thing fought like it was 20 inches. That was awesome. Once again, this riffle allowed me to get up closer to the fish. A lot of wind and I really uh, actually struggled a little bit with that drift, but I really leaned into it. I had a big bow in my cider, but it just stopped and uh, caught that nice little brownie. So I made a cast a couple casts ago and actually this fish hit. He's a little brownie. <laughs> Cute little guy. Wow, beautiful par marks. What I did is I just moved up one step and forward one step. So not only is positioning and it's very, you know, there's some depth here so I can get a little closer. That was still about a, yeah, it was over 20 feet. It's probably more like a 25 foot cast, but but positioning, not only are you doing it to, you know, remain stealthy and out of the sight of trout, it also helps with your fly placement and your drift. So sometimes all you need is one step forward and one step up or one step back and one step forward, something like that. Because what it does is as you move a little bit in the stream, your drift changes a little bit. So I caught, I had that fish bite a couple casts before that. And then I just moved one step closer and up just so I could try to get a vertical cider in there, which I did. And I couldn't do that before that. So I felt like if I could really slow my drift down and get vertical on them, I'd have a better shot. And sure enough, it worked. Here we go. <clears throat> so, this is a decent fish. This, uh, this fish makes me happy. I'm gonna tell you what I did here in a minute. Um, this rock right here, I just kept kind of working. I caught that fish down there and I just kind of, I went over this way and I swung around and I love shoots like this. So, this was, um, uh, 
got me up in that rock. That's why I should have landed it before I started talking about it. But I love shoots like this. So what I did is I I worked the front of this rock with a few casts, and I wanted because there's a deep trough in front of it, and they're always good lies for trout. So I had some good casts, and I started working the run up there. Had some good drifts, and it went through the middle. So I wanted to get vertical right on this rock. I practically scraped that rock. As a matter of fact, I thought my fly was gonna get hung up, but then it ended up just scooting around. It was perfect, but I moved into position. I'm just slightly, this is a, a 10 foot nine inch rod with my arm extended. You know, it's another three feet out. So you're talking 13, call it 14 feet. I made an upstream cast there. I made an upstream cast. I got a vertical sighter and I got it right here and he hit right on the side of that rock and it was perfect. I mean, it, it went exactly as planned and that was due to positioning. I would not have caught that fish if I was below it because I wouldn't have achieved depth. If I was over here, I had to be in the perfect spot to make the perfect drift. So, and, and the beauty about it is I was able to use this rock to block my view and that's why I was able to get so close. So it's all about positioning to get the perfect drift. Just think every time before I make a cast, I'm always thinking, what's the best way to achieve this drift? What position, where do I need to be standing to get the drift I want? And I'm always constantly moving. Even if I'm in a beautiful hole, as I move and almost fall, even if I'm in a beautiful hole, I just, every cast, I might just kind of shift my feet six inches. I'm constantly moving and adjusting my position just to try to get a really nice drift. Just don't get to a beautiful spot and then have concrete in your boots and just don't move. You gotta constantly be moving around to try to get your bugs in the right spot. Just inching my way across this really nice riffle right here. Just really working it thoroughly. There we go. Oh, nice fish. Real nice fish. This is a this is a big boy. This is a big boy. Ooh, this could be 20. Certainly 18. Mm. What a nice fish. This is a beautiful, beautiful fish right here. Look at that big old boy. Big old boy. What a fish. What a fish. I don't know if he's 20, but he's every bit of 18, that's for sure. What a beauty. Hit that little size 16. Let's see. It's a solid 18 incher right there. Look at that brown. What a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful fish. Thank you there, Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Brown. So let me tell you how we got that fish. So I started back here. I was a little shallow water and I started working my way across. So I would make a cast, make a nice drift, inch forward, make a cast, drift. And I literally felt like I was moving and working a half a step at a time. And I didn't walk up to the hole. The meat of the run is actually over there and that's where that fish was. But I fished all this water in front of me first. So I just slowly worked my way into position and that was the key. I slowly did it 
if I were to kind of splash through this water, that big fish would not, I mean, he would have moved on out. He would have slid over to the bank or under one of those rocks, but it's all about positioning and all about doing it in a really stealthy way. So I'm gonna be calling it quits here on Penn's. Uh, boy, it just ended with a gorgeous 18 inch brownie. That was, that was awesome. I, uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. I'm a big believer in just laying a really solid foundation in Euro nymphing. Uh, just those five things I talked about, uh, become a caster. Once you become a caster and not a lobber, the whole stream opens up for you. And once you make that cast, learn how to manage that line with your non-rod hand. Make sure you're doing a great job of managing your weight. Um, sometimes it's not all about the current and the depth. Sometimes the wind dictates how much weight you got to put on. And um, if you're ticking bottom too much, you have too much weight on, you got to lighten it up. Learn how to read that sight or move away from feeling your strikes to seeing your strikes. Um, and uh, that cider, it gives you the visual cues that you need and it really tells you what's going on with your bugs down on the stream bottom. And lastly, and it's really, really important, all of this stuff doesn't matter if you don't put yourself in the right position and be stealthy about it. So you just can't roll up to a hole upright because you're gonna spook all the trout out. So, you know, you just need to put yourself in the right position to get that proper drift because all of these things equal out to presentation because it's all about presentation and you need these five things to get the perfect presentation. When you get that, you're gonna put more trout in the net. And then once you have that solid foundation, that's when you can, it's all the changes on the margin that really elevate your game. Um, it's just becoming adaptive, uh, fishing in the wind, fishing in low water, high water, clear water, murky water, um, all the other things like dry dropper, jigging streamers, uh, floating a cider, Lay that foundation, and once you do that, that's when you can start expanding, going to a microliter, things like that. So concentrate on these five things, and I'm sure it's going to put more trout in the net. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, I'd appreciate it if you give me a thumbs up. If you like what I'm doing, I'd appreciate it if you would subscribe. And as always, tight lines, everybody. I'll talk to you later. Bye.